Hi, welcome to another episode of I Mustache You Something. And I am so excited that uh, Nermeen Riyad is here today. Uh, we, we go back quite a bit, at least several years. Um, I have already told her, this is not news to her, that she uh, is one of uh, the most terrifying people I know, um, where <laughs> I, I, I tell, I, actually, Nermeen, I tell this people, people this story all the time. Like, and, and you know how like Maggie, like I put, set you up to talk to Maggie recently. I told Maggie, I was like, just so you know, I had an out of body experience talking to Nermeen where she asked me to do something and I said no. And then all of a sudden I was transported out of my body watching her convince me. I was like, wow, <laughs> you're getting taken for a ride here, my friend. And I was like, yeah, I don't know what, to, like, she's, I don't know. It's like, a, uh, oh, dear. all right, I'll do whatever you say. It's so a wonderful uh, reputation. Oh, it's <laughs> no, I mean, like, I, and I'm, I'm like, that's, that doesn't happen. Um, yeah. So, so yes, yeah, so I, I'm excited to have her here. Um, and, you know, if you've seen any of these recordings before, uh, you know, that, um, you know, the goal here um, is, is to at least hear each other out and understand each other's perspectives. And uh, in most cases, I would say, I don't necessarily need to be convinced, but in this case, I'm I'm just gonna say, sure, yeah, I mean, yeah, whatever you say, yeah, no, yeah, I'll, I'll just, you know, go off and believe exactly what you told me. So, uh, for those of you that don't know, Nermeen uh, is the founder, and your current title is executive director. She's the founder and executive director of Coptic Orphans, which is an organization she started back in 1988 uh, when she was like two, three years old. About <laughs> uh, something like that. Uh, she was like in preschool. She started uh, uh, this organization. Uh, she currently lives in the uh, Washington D.C. area with her husband Yusri um, and her uh, kids Yusuf and Justina, uh, who are surprisingly around the same age she is. Like they're thirty and twenty-six. It's incredible. Um, so welcome, Nermeen. Thank uh, you. I, I think uh, I. I think first, like, I think we'd love to hear about kind of what inspired you to start Coptic Orphans. And I think it would be remiss not to at least explore that question a little bit for um, you to kind of share that story. Cause I've heard it before, but I, I love the story. Absolutely. Thank you, Mina. Uh, lovely to be on your show and uh, really exciting. And I can't wait to hear some of the other speakers and what they've got to say. Uh, what inspired me? I think the deep down motivation has always been um, a sense of gratitude to God. And um, having come to the United States when I was little, so I saw mom and dad struggle um, and how we went from one stage of our life to the next to the next and, and thinking there's nothing that we did to deserve all of this. You know, why, uh, what makes us any different? And so it's the constant gratitude and you're just like um, David, the prophet says, how can I repay you, O Lord, for all the good uh, that you have done for me? And that's kind of the sense that uh, was there as I was flipping through a magazine and I was in college and it said sponsor a child. And I was like, wow, sponsoring a child, this is wonderful, but 18 dollars every month where am I going to get that kind of money and of course I saw my friends and typical three dollars three dollars three dollars <laughs> managed to convince them yeah. exactly <laughs> and there was no 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 taking no for an answer and between the six of us uh, we were sponsoring a, a girl in Lebanon Soon after I graduated university and then I was working for the State Department, the Foreign Service, went overseas, got to meet, uh, uh, got to visit an orphanage, and then it suddenly hit me and I was like, why am I sponsoring a child in another country when these girls themselves here uh, are, are so in need? And, and, and that, was, that was the beginning of Coptic Orphans. It's that sense of, I wanna do something for you, searching it out, seeking it out, having your eyes open to it. And you know what's interesting, always, I, I often think doing good is never passive. Doing good is an active, um, uh, you go out of your door, you know, just as it says, and, you know, and the Lord went about doing good. It's a decision to go and do good. And so I challenge everyone who's listening is think about what good you have decided to do, not reacted to do. So that's the uh, Coptic Orphans in a nutshell. So 
I, I want to clarify for some people because I, I think a lot of them are, are hearing you talk and saying, well, if I don't start a multinational organization um, with employees and all of these things um, that you have built, you know, over the last 30 years, that it's, it's not worth doing anything, right? And they, they do the same thing kind of like that we do with the saints where it's like, oh, like, oh, I'm never going to be St. George or, you know, St. Mary. So like, why even bother? Right. So what would you say to that sort of like, okay, but I'm never going to be Nermin Riyadh. So what, why should I even bother? Yeah. And let me tell you, no one needs to think beyond the immediate. And, you know, just exactly like the parable of the Good Samaritan. What is Christ saying? Whoever God throws in your path, that's who you, you should act. So the Good Samaritan didn't say, oh, but this is just one of millions and hundreds of people who've been robbed. I mean, this is just a problem overall. We need to start a committee. We need to organize. We need to advocate to the public, you know, local council. None of that. You just, um, you act uh, on whatever that God has put in your path. And, and it's cute because, I mean, I tell you, when I started, they're like, you're never going to affect poverty in Egypt. It's just too big. And I was like, yep, yeah, you're right. I'm not, but I don't intend to. I just want to help these girls. Yes, but it's impossible to change the educational system and get them educated. Yep, yeah, you're absolutely right. But I want to get this one kid educated. <laughs> and so I'm going to do that. And then the one kid ended up being two, ended up being a hundred, ended up being a thousand. Right now, Yamina, Ehna, Usinna, we reached 65,000 children. Uh, that we've impacted in one way or the other. And let me tell you, someone had told me, um, this is where, you know, you'll have an entire organization with staff of a, over 120 worldwide and reaching this many children. Uh, I wouldn't have uh, believed it. I wouldn't have even understood it, actually. Right. Um, and so God doesn't ask you to understand. God doesn't ask you to have a vision. He asks you to act upon the immediate. And what do you think... Um is the difference between someone who says, well, I see what you're saying and it just sounds like too much trouble. And like, even that like $18 that you kind of put together with your friends, like, ah, I don't think that's worth it. Versus the person um, that says, well, I, I guess, you know, I can't do much, but I'm gonna do whatever little I'm able to do. What do you think the difference is between the, the, the and, and it's often subtle, like it's not like, oh, this person's a good person and this person's a bad person. Like, what's the difference between these two people? Like, because it's you subtle. Know something, it's, it's not even about uh, the other person. So it's, it's, not a, it's not about how we're helping the children or how, what we're doing for the mothers. Uh, this whole thing is really about you. Um, it's about, so, um, when, when the man went to Christ and said, how do you get to heaven? And he says, well, what does the law says? It says, love your neighbor, you know, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And he goes, yep, exactly. Do that and you will reach eternal life. Yes. And he goes, yes, yes, but who is my neighbor? And he went on to explain, well, your neighbor is whomever that you, you, um, you stop and you help. And so he asked the, the man uh, or the young lawyer, so who was the good neighbor. And he says, the one who showed compassion. And he goes, exactly. Go and do likewise. Okay. Are you telling me, Christ, are you telling me that in order to achieve eternal life, I must show compassion? Why? What does it matter? I mean, I believe, I was baptized. Why is it the reason he says you must show compassion is by showing compassion you become like Christ, you become doing, you become united and Christ-like. Um, and therefore, when you become Christ-like and when you become united, you have started your first steps in eternal life. It begins here, the kingdom begins, begins here. So, um, so without it, I don't know what would people do. I can't understand it. How can you live a life without showing compassion? So then St. John Chrysostom adds to it, makes it even more challenging. And he says, 
by you keeping this money that God gave you, you're actually stealing from the poor. Not only from the poor, you're stealing from God himself. So everything that we have, everything that was given to us, came to us from God. Um, our health, our wealth, our finances, everything, our jobs, our skills, our talents, our abilities, it came from God. So for me to hoard it and say, I'm going to only use it for myself. Thank you, God. You know, when I go up there and says, huh, what did you do with the five talents that I gave you? So, oh, I enjoyed them very much. Thank you so much. You know, happy to do it again. Right. Um, I don't think you're going to have you know, to be in good standing uh, in front of all the others. And so, so if St. John Chrysostom is saying um, in the, this is considered theft uh, from God, he raises the bar even higher. Now, here's what's interesting. Okay, so if Christ is asking us to do that, to be able to achieve eternal life, um, then the poor man, I love this St. John Chrysostom quote, um, he says, um, the poor man is indebted to you for a piece of bread. Yeah, you gave him a piece of bread. But you are indebted to him for your salvation. What? I'm the one indebted? The poor man was the one who helped me? He assisted in my path to salvation? Who now is in need? Who's the one in need now? Who must go out of their way to do good? Because it assists in your own salvation. So for me, I mean, St. John just kind of turns the tables and you're like, okay, so then we go, <laughs> so we go to the rich people and we say, we've come to help you. <laughs> we're going to help you. <laughs> yeah, we're going to help each other to the salvation and I'll tell you how to do it. So um, yeah, that's, that's the, the, the motivation. That's the passion. That's, uh, uh, and you know, Yamina, that is the reason why it's very hard for people to say no, because and where, yeah, I mean, it, there's so much passion in it because it's so authentic and it's so true um, that you can't help but be moved. I was moved tremendously by all this. And the more I read and understand, the more, the more moved I am, so. You reminded me actually of a funny thing that happened yesterday where um, somebody was actually helping us uh, with something related to KV and she was so sweet and she was so helpful and she was like amazing spent like more than an hour with us, like giving us advice and telling us and whatever. And at the end of it, she says, thank you so much for letting me help. And we're like, <laughs> what are you talking? Like, we, we are indebted to you. But I think yeah. it, it, it speaks like, I, it didn't make sense to me at the time because I was like, like, why, why are you thanking me? Because you're doing us a favor. But I think it speaks to what you're saying that exactly. when you're, you're doing something that is meaningful that you feel like, okay, I could do this, you know, with maybe not infinite energy, but I think it like when we say your yoke is sweet and your burden is light, it comes from this specific thing where like the presence of the Holy Spirit and, and God blessing the service, it makes it like, okay, yeah, like we're going to hit some roads that are challenging and, you know, some bumps that, you know, are, are going to feel insurmountable, but it's like, okay, but like, let's, let's just keep going. And that yeah. feeling that like you're doing something meaningful, like, I, I think yeah. that resonates with me. And like, I'm thinking back to this conversation yesterday, or, or I was like, you're th like, why are you thinking like, like, Abus Ideki, like, thank you. But exactly. uh, I think that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. So I, I want to go back to something, and maybe this is the point where I must ask you something. Um, we have to do that. Uh, you know, the, the corporate sponsorship requires it. Um, um, but I, I think th there's something that you said earlier that I don't know how I feel about this, and I want you to clarify it for me. Because you said you, you had so many privileges, right? And you, you ask this question, why us? And I think there's this concept called uh, survivor's guilt, where like, you know, God forbid something bad happens and it, you know, disproportionately affects someone else or another group. And then the people that are left behind feel guilty. And sometimes there really isn't any rhyme or reason. Like, you know, accidents happen, things happen, and sometimes some people get lucky and some people don't. Now,
is that is that the motivation or is there is there something that is like a clarification of that like do you feel guilty that you got out of egypt or is that something that could be misconstrued by the way that that i heard it yeah no uh, um great question yeah yamina um uh, not at all uh, any kind of survival guilt or whatever on the contrary uh what a precious gift that god gave us i mean the default is we'd all still be in egypt I mean, if, if the United States hadn't created immigration uh, bills in 1960 or whatever and allowed for immigrants from, from Egypt to come and live in the United States, we'd still all be in Egypt. So this is a huge gift from God. And, and the question about, well, why Egypt? Why, why, why should we care? I'll tell you, I'll tell you a story. Um, I was, so in working in the Foreign Service, uh, the US Foreign Service, I was stationed in Casablanca, Morocco, and part of the, the coverage, the geographic coverage I had included Algeria, Tunisia, uh, Spain, and Portugal, et cetera. So I was on my way to Algeria. So this is 1989-ish timeframe, um, or even earlier, 88. Um, and, um, and so my ex Sunday school teacher, he goes, oh, you know, you know, there's a church in Algeria. So if ever you go, here's the address. And I was like, okay, thank you. I will definitely do that. Landed in Algeria, hopped into a taxi and gave him the address and said, you know, I'd like to go and um, to this place. And he goes, okay, so we go and I look around and I was like, you know, um, is this the right address? He goes, yes. And I was like, uh, I only see this huge mosque where, you know, and usually opposite uh, is the church and I'm looking everywhere, I don't see it. And I was like, well, where's the church? He goes, oh, that's the church. He points to the mosque. I said, there are no more Christians here. And that struck me tremendously. In Algeria, are there any more the, the original Christians of Algeria? No. What about Tunisia? The great city of Carthage. This is where Augustine came from. Where are the indigenous Christians? There are none. Then you look at Iraq, emptied out of Christians. In Syria, the trouble that they're having. The only place in the Middle East who has a sizable Christian population is Egypt. How in the world did they manage it? How in the world was I, had, that I had this incredible privilege to be born Christian, Egyptian and Christian? What in the world did my great grandfathers do to preserve the faith so that I can be born? Do you realize how many generations had to have preserved the faith for me to have been born as a Christian in Egypt? At least 100 or 120, I don't remember the calculations of how many years from St. Mark to, till today. Um, so, so then I sit back and I go, wow, these people, these people did a lot. These people did the best thing that they could have done for me. And I owe them a debt of gratitude. I owe them for having preserved the faith. And not only have they preserved the faith, they're in the front line. Where is the persecution that we are getting? Absolutely nothing. Well, thank God. I mean, I don't ask, I want persecution on, on anyone. And yet they over there continue to be the front line. When the churches were being bur bur burned in um, 2013, I remember um, um, one of the volunteer reps, she was telling me about what was happening in such um, there was uh, the, uh, what happened, uh, the Elgish uh, came, there was Hasrat uh, Tagawal, um, uh, which is uh, curfews and such things. Oh, actually, this was a, even before the church is being built, uh, burned, so there was this big uh, problem in Abu Uras. Uh, a fight in Mishim Muslimin and, and the army had to come in and such, and it was during Holy Week. And she goes, uh, and despite the curfew, we all went to church. Uh, uh, lady, older ladies, younger ladies, men, boys, everybody, we all went to church. You know, a curfew, which meant you could go to jail if you're out, um, didn't stop them. And then she says, and then even the, the, the soldiers who were uh, standing in front of the church, our shabab, our youth said, go, you should, you know, leave, leave me here. Uh, and I was like, wait, wait, well, why would you want to tell them to, to leave? And she says, because this is our church, we protect it. No one else. This is ours. And I was like, 
wow, you are so brave. And she looked at me and she goes, what? Wouldn't you do the same thing? And Yamina, I sat and I thought, if St. Mark's, Washington, D.C. was being attacked, I mean, I would tweet about it. I would definitely tweet about it. <laughs> From the garage. Uh -huh. Right? But would I rush to protect it because this is my church? And I, I, I just, I, I'm, I'm humbled by the, the people of Egypt, the Christians of Egypt. I am humbled by their faith. Um, I am honored to be, to be able to call myself a cult because of them and, and their strength of faith. Um, I'm, just, I'm just enamored and I want to do everything in my power uh, to help them, to strengthen them, to preserve, to give them whatever tools that will allow them to preserve the faith uh, from generation to generation. At what point, though, does a, a Coptic identity become something that is sort of irrelevant to people in the diaspora? Because that's something that I think less so with our generation, but more so with the, the second, third generation that's coming through, you know, they're asking, like, what does Egypt have to do with me? And these mm -hmm. identity issues are not something, I think you and I identify with Egypt culturally, spiritually, and personally, right? So how does that zeal and how does that sense of connection to all of these things that you're saying, which I like, you know, get sort of implicitly, but if somebody else is listening to this and going, yeah, but that doesn't really apply to me, right? I'm going to find my identity. I'm going to find my spiritual connection elsewhere or in a different interpretation of what the Coptic church means to me. And this is how I want the church to respond to that need here in the diaspora. So how do you, how do you bridge that? You know, uh, absolutely, and I, um, uh, I we we had conversations and discussions about about exactly that. Well, what does it mean? What does the Coptic identity really really mean? And what does Egypt have to do with it? And um, and can I can I be Coptic and not know anything about Egypt? Um, um, can I still call myself a Copt and hate Molochia? Um, <laughs> sorry. No, that's a no. That's <laughs> a <great laughs> <one>. <laughs> I mean, I, <laughs> okay, like there's the door. Um, no, no, I like uh, you have to have some standard, please. <laughs> I agree. But, um, so I think in any Copt, um, I think can acknowledge that the, the roots of our faith is very much in Egypt. And, and to be able to understand that faith, that uh, Coptic faith, uh, it's good to delve into that and to have an understanding of that. We're talking about monasticism, very much affected our, uh, our understanding of our faith. Martyrdom is, is very much a Coptic thing. It's a very much a Coptic um, flavor to our faith. Um, the School of Alexandria uh, and the theology that comes from it. And so these things will shape us whether we like it or not. Once you walk into a Coptic church, these things have a way of shaping you. So you can understand it or you could be oblivious to it. Either way works. I mean, it's not gonna keep you, you know, from, from reaching uh, your goal and such, but it, I think it makes it easier. I think it makes it a, a, a stronger, a more, a more integrity in the understanding of the faith and, and what things are around you. Um, and also, it gives you an embodiment of the faith being lived. And so here it becomes harder. Come on, uh, you know, you could be Sayyim and nobody else in, at your job even understands Yani Siyam. You know, you could be um, anticipating, you know, Eid on January 7th and you have to kind of explain it. In Egypt, you don't explain. Right. In Egypt, you're assumed uh, in Minta Sayyim. And, and they even have menus now at restaurants. You, oh, you want the Siomi uh, menu? Oh, here it is, rather than us going, oh, do you have anything vegan? <laughs> it happens in New Jersey, by the way, also. Like, yeah. My buddy always had, uh, he, he pulled into the drive through uh, yeah. in New Jersey, and he was like from out of state, like from a place like where, you know, there's like a normal prevalence of Coptic Egyptians. But 
he pulls up to this drive through and order, order something siami and the lady on the other end of the machine she goes is the cyber habibi <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Like only in New Jersey. <laughs> only in New Jersey. And and so it, I mean, so what does that do to your to your faith in the in the, that you begin to see the embodiment of faith? And then you you get to see um you get to see people that you you then you kind of step back and you go, ah, now I understand, oh Lord, what you mean by faith. Now I understand, oh Lord, what you mean by compassion or by sacrifice it becomes real and 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 the lovely thing is especially in the south of egypt i am totally pro saida i'm not a saidi myself but i i really appreciate the saida more than anyone else in egypt but to go into the saida and to begin to see that faith uh, lived daily not only on sunday and we're experts on the sunday living um, but to be to see that lived and to see the obstacles that they face and still um, have that strong faith. So the roots is there. Uh, and I encourage everybody to go and learn more about it. So I, I'm, I'm actually from Asyut, so I, um, I, I, I mean, you know, I, I, I'm a little partial to say it. So like, I appreciate the, uh, the shout out. Um, and I think that's something that people kind of underestimate here in the United States that Egypt isn't this like, you know, monolithic, like sort of like uniform. And, you know, the, the cultural differences in Egypt, I think, are actually more than the cultural differences. Um, in America. Yeah, you could say that. I mean, if you go to a, a Coptic church in Zamalek and a Coptic church in uh, yes, Zamalek, mm. like, there, I mean, like, it's going to be like two different planets versus here, you go to a Coptic church, like anywhere in the United States, there are going to be some people from Zamalek and some people from Maghera and some people from Bursaid and some people, you know, that are third generation. So like the, the cultural profile in the United States seems like, at least to me, less of a shift. But the difference yeah. is that here, everybody kind of, you know, um, goes everywhere and sees the differences and like they're like oh my god it's so different than my church like we say amen not amen I can't believe they say amen here like they're so meh. and like meanwhile in Egypt like a lot of people really don't move around yes uh, so I, I guess the, the next question that I would have is you know is is that a benefit that we have here, that we have this awareness, or is it a weakness? And how do we transform the weakness into a strength? Interesting. And uh, um, some of our, um, this, some of the Shabab would go on Surf to Learn. That that's the program that Coptic Orphans has, where they can go and they can teach English in uh, in the Sa'id. And um, how many of them have come back just appreciating appreciating that culture? Um, I think just exposure to it. Uh, with open eyes, um, they actually, like, they fall in love with them. And um, one came back and she was like, she was so happy. She found a man at St. Mark's, Washington, D.C., and she was just so thrilled. <laughs> Whereas before we would all look down, oh, you know, doesn't he realize what country he's in? But, um, but for a second or a third generation to, to kind of honor that. Uh, I thought that that was really, really nice. So um, I think we just have to see the good. Likewise, you know, from them looking at us, um, people with open eyes or, you know, with an open heart will see the good uh, that the West brings and to see the good that the East brings. And, you know, the best of both worlds. Use the best of both worlds. Why not? I mean, that, that's a touchy subject. That's a whole other 40-minute conversation, the, the good of the West. I need a... What do you mean? Yeah, there's a lot of good. And, and see on my home, yeah. like this idea that there is good somewhere outside of Egypt and we're not trying to recreate Egypt. Like I think some people would, would attach that to the faith, would say that is not a Christian statement. That is a heretical statement. Yeah, so what do you think about that? Like if someone, like if you said that, and again, like you're saying a lot of things that I agree with, but like I, I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying sometimes with someone else's ears and going, you know, somebody who really doesn't identify with an Egyptian identity might think the, 
I, 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 I don't have an interest in this. And, you know, I think you, you, you reasonably explained, okay, no, but like, if, like whether you like it or not, it still does have something to do with you, right? And then you say, oh, but the West also has some things to offer. And then somebody who's like the opposite mindset of that, right? Like where you can't like seamlessly go back and forth between the two cultures and the two environments and the two ways of thinking, someone else will hear that and go, we just said Egypt is good. We just said Egypt is great. And now you're going to say, you're going to say that they're okay? No. Right? So what do you respond to that? No, there's no question that um, the West has, uh, has has a lot, a lot of good. Uh, so here's a, here's what's really cute. Um, we, in Coptic Orphans, we have uh, the heart of the East and the mind of the West, right? And so for us, we um, we saw in the um, the children. This was 20 years ago. In the, the children were taking lessons and they didn't know how to read. And, and it's like, well, what is this? This is ridiculous. Why are we paying money for lessons? And they don't, they don't even know how to read it. So we went to the volunteer reps and we said, you have exactly, um, you have exactly um, uh, six months, or nine months, you have exactly nine months. All these children have to read or else, I'm sorry, they leave our program. Yeah, you know what it means to leave our program? It means no more assistance, no more finances, no more whatever. So كلهم, they're like, لا, حرام, زمبون, إيه, الحكومة, طب إحنا هنعمل إيه? And this is where then the American mind comes in and goes, mm, yeah, sorry, they'll be out. And this whole haram ma'lish So we were like, sorry, no. And and then they were like, oh, oh we better take them seriously because don't American and they will do it. <laughs> they will get children kicked out of the program. And let me tell you, that was the biggest motivator. And all of them, Ligiri got his wife, whatever it takes, do what you have to take. And that year, 700 children learned to read for the very first time. And Lee, because it's this kind of, um, you know, Al Kilma. Also, the management, Western management is extremely useful. Western administration, extremely useful. We have a lot of good that comes uh, that comes from the West. Planning, for example, is a really good uh, thing that really comes comes from the West. Um, I think I, I love how in the Coptic Orphans, it's it's the best of both worlds. Again, the best of both worlds. And and if someone says that something that you or I would say should be thought through and like, okay, planned and, you know, measured and, you know, God forbid we use the word accountability or, you know, some, something like that, where it's like, no, like we have to follow up and make sure, like, yeah, we said we were going to do blah, 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 but let's check in and let's make sure that it was actually done, right? Yeah. And they respond with, لا, كل حاجة بتيجي بالبركة. Yeah. <laughs> How would you respond to that? How would my response to that? Uh, uh, they want to manipulate you, right? Like they want to say, no, like your lack of faith is the reason that you want to use this instead of this. Yeah. I don't you mean, I think in Nahna, we, we don't argue, we just act. Yeah, we just do. You know, you're like, no, uh, you know, uh, la, 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 and you say, okay, um, uh, November 20th will be the day that we'll discuss to see how, where we stand. And there's, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm not gonna argue. But I don't feel that any of that that I really like in the West um, discourse. Exactly what you're doing, discourse. The ability to nefuguliti, the ability to disagree and not lose each other as friends. And to the extent, Yamina, in them, um, I would actually tell people, uh, from us, I would say, okay, let's not say, I have an idea. Or, well, my idea is Keza. Why don't we say, well, here's an idea. Lee, to separate my idea from my person. So you could criticize this idea all you want and I will have no problem. I don't, I'm, it's separated from me. Mm -hmm. But in Egypt, Yani, it's all wrapped up. You know, how dare you disagree with my idea? La idea haga inta inta haga thani fa the ability to uh, to listen the ability to separate between the idea and the person and and actually you know um how ola came in what i realized is in egypt growing up you know like in kindergarten and first grade and kid 
What do kindergarten and first graders hear their tables look like? What are the tables in the kindergarten look like? Question to you. Uh, uh, tables uh, are uh, round, typically round, right? No, oh, in, sure. in kindergarten, first grade. <laughs> you haven't been paying attention, have you? Listen, okay. Like Mary, like my wife Mary, will be like, you didn't see like <laughs> this on the kitchen island that you walked past like 10 times. Like oh, I, okay. Yeah, very okay, good. We like, we won't ask you any more questions. No, no, no. <laughs> like like observational questions. I'm like, uh, I don't know, trapezoid. That's the answer. <laughs> <Trapezoid>. <laughs> How would look? Um, so okay, now I know it's round. If someone else so, asks me, it's round. It's round. And why is it round? Because from the very beginning, we're taught to work together. We're taught, we're a group, the blue team, the A team, the whatever. Look at kindergarten and first grade in Egypt. Saf, saf, so your rows after row, individual. You and the teacher is all that matters. If you succeed, Yanni, if your goal is to succeed and hope that everybody else fails so you could be the top of the class. And so the whole concept of working together, we never learned it. We never learned it. Um, in the West, you learn that. And hence, you know, the whole idea of cops can't work together. Actually, yeah, they can, they can. And we're proving them wrong. I'm, I'm, I love proving the naysayers wrong. <laughs> um, we share that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Oh, yes, we can. And it's a little bit of adapting and a little bit of what we learned here in the West and a little bit of, you know, helping those along in the East. Um, and look, we're working together, working very well together. Thank God. Oh, Nermeen, I wish we could get this uh, longer and longer, um, but uh, just uh, so that people don't end up uh, hating these recordings as being uh, obscenely long and annoying to listen to, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to have to wrap us up and just say thank you so much for, for coming. Um, I think I, as always, learned a lot uh, from talking to you and, you know, the, the perspectives that you shared with us on you know, having that orientation to to serve and asking what you can do, even if it's small, big, whatever it is, whatever God blesses us to be able to do is important. Um, the balance between East and West, the, the, the heart of, you said the heart of the East and the mind of the West. I, I will definitely steal that and use it without attribution. Um, so forgive me in advance. <laughs> Yeah, unless I have it. <laughs> you know, listen, publish it, put it on a piece of paper, and you know, uh, yeah, we'll we'll give you uh, the, the copyright to it. But until then, I'll be like, maybe, maybe not. I might mention or not mention that I got this from your name. Um, but I think that's a beautiful concept, and I think that the dialogue piece, I think, is a huge one. Um, and I think you're right. Like this, this is kind of what I'm trying to do here is to, you know. It, encourage people to say what they have to say and realize, hey, like we're all allowed to, to share our opinions and our ideas and our thoughts. And there's no such thing as somebody whose opinion doesn't matter. So, you know, hopefully we'll have a nice mix of people and a nice spectrum of different opinions. Um, not all of them as convincing and as strong as yours, but you know, um, all good, all good. Do you, have any, uh, do you have any final thoughts, any final wisdom for us? Yes, the final is, I mean, in everything that you do, do it for the glory of God. Um, yeah, and that's the most important thing. And um, how many times I've told God, the day, the day, Yaro, the day that Coptic Orphans stops glorifying God is the day I ask you, O oh Lord, to end it, and we all go our own way. But that must be always your underlying, underlying um, foundation. I love it. And with that, I uh, thank you and I thank our listeners. Very good. Thank you, Mina. Wonderful to have you with you.